Allah صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن جاءكم فاسق بنبأ فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين Bless your gathering with remembrance of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Rasulullah and his honorable and purified progeny recite the second salawat For Allah to shower onto this gathering with His infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. <laughs> Abu Huraira has transmitted thousands of hadiths from the last and divine messenger of God. And indeed, this personality is, an of, is of extreme importance to any student of Islamic sciences. The total number of hadiths transmitted by this personality in the nine books that belong to our brothers and sisters in the Sunni school of thought reaches 8,960 hadiths. In the 
six books known as the Sihah. His hadith reach a total number of 6,000. And only in Sahih al-Bukhari, 460 hadiths, all transmitted by one man. Al-Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal transmits 4,000 hadiths by Abu Huraira. Therefore, this personality is a personality of extreme importance for a person who studies hadith, for a person who studies Islamic history, for a person who studies tafsir al-Quran, for a person who wants to understand the originality of the religion of Islam, then here is a personality that you will come across prior to hearing a narration from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam across the Muslim world. Whether it is a hadith attributed to Rasulullah from the Friday pulpits, or is a book written on traditions by Rasulullah, or it is a book of tafsir, or it is a book of hadith, or it's a book that discusses Islamic history, prior to many of the hadiths that you will come across as a student of Islam, you will find the name of Abu Hurairah as being one of the transmitters of those traditions. And therefore, this personality must be examined. This personality must be understood. For surely a person who tells me of 8,000 incidents that occurred in the time of Rasulullah must have spent many years with sincerity and quality time next to Rasulullah. As in if you are able to quote 8,000 incidents that have happened, in the lifetime of Rasulullah, you must have spent many years in sincerity, quality time next to the Prophet. Furthermore, this personality must have been amongst the most educated and literate personalities in the Arabian Peninsula. Because today, if I tell you, take a piece of paper and pen, and write 8,000 incidents that have happened in your life. And you're at the age 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 years old. You would not be able to remember 8,000 incidents. Or 6,000 incidents. Or even four to 500 incidents. It would be very difficult for somebody who is illiterate to be able to remember them. Therefore, he must have wrote down the 8,000 incidents and he must have been literate, he must have been educated and he must have been one of the closest and most sincere companions to Rasulullah and therefore he becomes a person of extreme importance and a person of extreme interest to every Muslim that look at this man with the utmost sincerity. And he has spent every minute of the hour, every hour within his day next to Rasulullah, within the years from the birth of Rasulullah all the way to his end, so that we can enjoy a legacy of having 8,000 hadiths transmitted by him and the most reliable of the books. And of course, just like any other religion, brothers and sisters, the religion of Islam, after the demise of its prophet, just like the Christian religion and just like the Jewish faith, there were people who were honest and there were people who were trustworthy and there were people who strived and struggled and did whatever it took for them to protect the legacy of the prophet, to protect the message of the prophet. Similarly, in the religion of Islam, we had individuals who did whatever that was in their capability and were even willing to give their lives to protect the originality of the religion of Islam, the legacy of Rasulullah. And we, just like any other religion, Christianity and Judaism, in the religion of Islam, find personalities 
who after the demise of the Prophet began the business of lying and fabricating. Some people lied for the sake of popularity, to seek popularity. And some people lied for the sake of money and wealth. And some people lied in order to defame the religion of Islam and take back people to the era of Jahiliyyah. And believe it or not, some people actually lied to protect Islam. Some people actually lied to serve Islam. How so? There is an incident where a man sat there and said, if you read this surah of the Quran, you get, for example, this enormous thawab. And he was, you know, he was very generous in giving the thawabs. If you read, for example, those ayat, then Allah will give you 12 mansions in paradise and 70 virgins in paradise, and He will forgive all your sins. So they came to him, they said to him, excuse me, where do you get those hadiths from? We never heard them, this is or original to you, unique to you. He says, yes, I'm making them up, because people are not reading the Qur'an anymore. So I want to encourage them to read the Qur'an. So I'm making those hadiths in order to bring people back to the spirit of Islam so that they begin reciting the Qur'an. Similarly, some folks, some individuals started fabricating hadith for the purpose of their school of thought. As in, for example, the Shafi'is will tell you that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam predicted the presence of al-imam al-shafi'i amongst this nation and the malikis will tell you that rasulullah predicted the existence of this scholar who will save the religion of islam anas bin malik and the hanbalis did the same thing get me wrong brothers and sisters for we as well experience the same phenomenon within the madhab of ahl al-bayt within the madhab that is attributed to the teachings and the legacy of Rasulullah and his purified progeny. Some people, out of love for Ahl al-Bayt, or out of their enthusiasm for the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, began to exaggerate, began to exaggerate in many areas, whether it was the fada'il of Ahl al-Bayt, whether it was, for example, the amount of worship of Ahl al-Bayt, whether it was the the students and the disciples of Ahl al-Bayt, or in the area of the ziyara of the shrines of Ahl al-Bayt, or the area of, for example, mourning and crying and being saddened at the tragedies that fell onto the Ahl al-Bayt, many people are also considered wadda'een and liars or fabricators or also known as the ghulat. That is why if you study the history of Shi'ism, you find that the scholars have always fought the phenomenon of ghulat, those who exaggerate the position of Ahl al-Bayt to an extent that they put, for example, the infallible imams above Rasulullah. And sometimes they would even take it a step further than that. And that is why the scholars question their ahadith, question their authenticity. And therefore we have today in the Hawza one of the most important sciences for any marja and any scholar is Ilmur Rijal, a science that examines the chain of narrators of hadith. And I don't mean the chain of narrators of hadith in Sunni school of thought, but I mean in the books of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, and in within our books, the scholars come and examine their chain of narrators, and they will come across some personalities, and they tell you that this person is kadab, he's a liar. This person is wadda, he's a fabricator. This, this person is a mughali, an exaggerator. And that is how they filter them the ahadith that have hasanul isnad, good sanad, good standings, and they filter the ones that have infiltrated our books. 
And in order for us to understand the phenomenon of authenticity of hadith within the Shia school of thought, we have to also understand the process and the evolution of Shi'ism today, until today. But one of the most important periods within the Shia school of thought and within the evolution of Shi'ism is the period in which the very first government was established for the followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Safawi dynasty or the Safawi government. And prior to that, the Fatimi dynasty, which was in Egypt. What was the role of politics on Shia Hadith? What was the role of politics on the Shia Ulama? What was the role of, for example, politics at that period that played on fabricating Hadith or Hadiths infiltrating our books? So don't think that I'm sitting here discussing other schools and other books and other personalities while we ignore our own. But due to the fact that we have began the series and we've been discussing the originality of Islam versus the distorted version of Islam and we concluded our series of historical analysis until the end of the Bani al-Abbas or the Abbasid dynasty. Now we have, while we have discussed history, we come and we discuss our books. What is it in our books today that is questionable? And the books of the majority of the Muslims. Why? Because many of you, today, tomorrow, yesterday, a year ago, five years ago, since 9-11, until probably eternity, you will be asked in school, at work, through the media, blogs, newspapers, that aren't you a Muslim? Says yes. Isn't your name Muhammad? Yes. Isn't your name Ali? Yes. Aren't your parents Muslim? Yes. Then why don't you explain to me this hadith and this book of Muslims, the most popular book of Muslims, for example, Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or Tirmidhi or Nisa'i. Why don't you come and explain this hadith for the rest of us? We're not Muslims. We want you to illuminate us, teach us. And you say to them that I am not a scholar. Or another answer would be that we don't follow those books. Those, fo those books are the books that belong to other madahib. But indeed I tell you this is not the response of an educated follower of Ahlul Bayt. The followers of Ahlul Bayt must be known in their ilm. By being educated, by being able to defend the religion of Islam at any given point. By being able to stand and debate not only scholars within the religion of Islam, but also scholars outside the religion of Islam. And if you see the individuals surrounding Rasulullah, the companions of Rasulullah, those who have been praised by him, those who have been honored by him, those who defended and carried the religion of Islam to the next generation, you not only find them to be people who defended Rasulullah in battle, but people who defended Rasulullah's ideology. People who defended Rasulullah's legacy. People who defended Rasulullah's thought. Or else, why is it that, for example, the Sahabi Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, fought the regime of his time until he was deported, until the last days of his life he lived in exile, and they say that the last days of his life, when he was living in Rabada, he died out of hunger. His son came to the caravans of the people. They said, he says to them, are you not Muslim? They say, yes. He says, have you heard of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari? Of course we have heard of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, he's a companion of Rasulullah. He says to them, here he is, he died out of hunger, by himself. Or another companion by the name of Ammar ibn Yasir. Why was Ammar killed? And why was he beheaded? And why did they fight him so much? It's because of the fact that Ammar not only defended Rasulullah's legacy physically, but also mentally. Similarly, the rest of the companions who were fought who went to exile, who were imprisoned, and amongst those companions, for example, 
that saw extreme torture was Maytham. Maytham al Tamar. Why was he tortured? Why did they amputate his limbs? Why did they cut his tongue? Why did they rip his stomach open and take out his guts? Why this extreme amount of hatred towards one personality? It's because this personality was, was filled with knowledge. This personality was the disciple of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he spoke the truth until the moment that he was killed and he died and he became a martyr. Similarly, the personalities surrounding Al-Imam al Hussein, Al-Imam Abu Abdullah al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram, the personalities who surrounded him were not just warriors, were not just brave men, were not just sincere in their love for Imam al Hussein, but indeed they were scholars. They were individuals who understood the position of Imam al Hussein through ilm. And that is why amongst them, were the Sahaba and amongst the greatest of them was Habib ibn Madahir. Habib ibn Madahir being the eldest man in the camp of Imam al Hussein, who was also a companion of Rasulullah. The Ahl al Bayt who surrounded Al Imam al Hussein were all scholars. The companions who surrounded Imam al Hussein were all fuqaha and scholars. Similarly, if you look at the history of Shi'ism and you reach Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq and Imam Zain al-Abideen, Imam Zain al-Abideen would go by slaves, illiterate slaves, he would educate them, he would teach them, he would uplift their mental status and then he would release, he would free them and release them so they become scholars of Islam, so they become ulama. Similarly, Al-Imam Al-Baqir and the founder of the Ja'fari Madhab, Al-Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. They didn't look for those who had money. They didn't look for those who had muscles. They didn't look for those who had political power or those who had fame, but they looked at those who had dedicated their lives to seeking and spreading the uloom and the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt. Therefore, back to what I was trying to tell you brothers, if you are asked of a hadith or you are asked of a historical account that exists in any Muslim books, a follower of Ahl al-Bayt is an individual who can give a logical response. A follower of Ahl al-Bayt is not the one who says, I don't know, I don't follow those books, I disagree with them. Well, how about if they bring you hadith from our own books that are shameful, that are questionable, that are fabricated, that have been inserted in, uh, into our books? What will you say then? And this is a dilemma that we have. Today, you find people creating cartoons and mocking Rasulullah and Islam, and all the teachings come from Islamic books. You find them creating movies to mock Rasulullah, but they don't bring anything from themselves. It's not fiction. But indeed, everything they have in that movie comes directly from the books of the Muslims that have also been given the title of Sihah. And therefore, Islam suffered from liars. Islam suffered from fabricators. Islam suffered from those who later on sat on the member of Rasulullah and they lied to people and they misled them. And lying is a phenomenon that, you know, you shouldn't, we shouldn't get so shocked. It's, oh, how can people lie? Well, we see liars every day. We come across people who lie on a daily basis. You know, there are many forms of lying. One, it's for example the lying you see at home. A father or a mother who calls his daughter, her daughter, after midnight, where are you? What are you doing? Oh, I'm at my friend's house. What are you doing? We're studying. This is the biggest lie in history. And of course, the parents worry about their children. So they want them to come back home and the children don't want to go back home. So one of the lies is that I'm studying at my friend's house. Or for example, husbands who lie to their wives. You know, 
He's sitting there watching football with his friends. His wife calls him, he says, we're discussing the Jamaat issues here, you know. How to have a better Muharram program next year. Or for example, in the end of the month, when the credit card bill comes and it's too high, and the husband asks his wife, why is the credit card bill so high? Then there you see all sorts of lies, mashallah. But on a more serious note, what do we take away from the majalis of Imam al-Hussein? Is it just history or do we relate to our lives? Yes. Today, the Muslim community living in the West, whether it's Australia, whether it's Europe, whether it's the United States of America, how do we treat this land? And how do we treat those who have welcomed us to this land? Whether it is the government, whether it is our employees, whether it is, for example, the school, whether it is the employers that we have, or the employees that we have. Do we lie to them or should we be honest with them? Because don't tell me you have not come across individuals who have not been the most honest people when it comes to, for example, collecting from welfare. In fact, one of the Maulanas, you told me, I went to a particular community and they told me, Sayyidna, why stay at a hotel? We give you a nice apartment. So I stayed at the apartment. In the middle of the night, I saw the police knocking at the door. So he said, I opened the door, I said, excuse me, what have I done? They said, what's your name? So I gave them my name. What's your occupation? Well, I'm a religious scholar of why you come here, I've come here to give lectures. What's the problem? They said, this, the problem is that the person who has taken this home from the welfare system claims he lives here. And for five months, nobody's been in this house. So when you arrive today, we come to ask you, who's, well, you know, where is this guy? What happened to him? Is he alive? Is he dead? So I told them, well, you know, the owner of this home, he's back home enjoying his vacation. Who takes six months vacation? A person on welfare. A person on welfare. Why? Because the check comes in the end of the month. You don't have to work. You go and you take a vacation back home, you enjoy the ziyara, you, is this halal or haram? Are we cheating ourselves? Are we teaching, cheating Allah? What is it that we take away from the member of Imam al Hussein? Do we take honesty? Do we take the fact that our Imams themselves, they used to work on a farm and sweat? And they asked him, they asked one of the imams, they said to him, what if you die while you're working so hard on this farm? He had a farm, and he was working so hard on the farm, so they said to him, what if you die in the state? Shouldn't you be doing ibadah? Shouldn't you be doing... He says, indeed, my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam has stated. That the greatest form of ibadah is a man who seeks halal rizq for his family. And if I were to die in this state, then I die as a shaheed in the way of Allah. Just like the shuhada who fell martyr next to Rasulullah. And yes, Islam teaches us to earn an honorable living, an honest living. And that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if a man goes and seeks halal rizq for his family, then he's doing jihad fi sabilillah. And if he were to die in that state, then he dies as a martyr. Some brothers, couple of brothers, they came to Amir al-Mu'mineen to pay their dues, to pay their khums, to pay their zakat. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says to them, where is your youngest brother? Where is he? They said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, innahu taraka dunya He's left the dunya, he's become abid, zahid, he prays salat al-layl, fasts all day. He doesn't leave the house. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Wa man Who takes care of him and his kids and his bills and his food? They said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, we do. We take care of him. We, because he has left the dunya, he's become a mystic. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Wallah, you are greater than him in the eyes of Allah. And you have a higher position in Allah's 
status than him. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to pray all night and fast all day and not go to work and not to earn a living. In fact, Islam encourages us to have an abundance of wealth. Don't say this is enough. Alhamdulillah, I make $1,000 a month. It's enough for me and my children. The rest of the time, I will spend it in the center. The rest of the time, I will spend it in ibadah. Some people think that this is the teaching of Islam. In fact, Islam is against this. Islam teaches us that we become professionals and successful and powerful people so that we can help others. So we can be generous in our giving. If we had a bunch of powerless, impoverished individuals in our community, then how would we be able to empower the religion of Islam? How will we be able to spread the religion of Islam? How will we be able to erect masajid and houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? <clears throat> Therefore, today, one of the greatest of dilemmas that we have is people who think that since this is an un-Islamic system, we can sometimes, you know, do a little lie here, a little lie there on the tax papers. You know, I spoke to an accountant. And, and you know, sometimes some people tell you, don't speak about those things because they're shameful. It is more shameful. It is way more shameful when they come and they take someone from the community for front and put him in prison than speaking about such things to perfect our community from the member. Which one is more shameful? So he says, say it. Muslims always complain that we are not respected. They respect other minorities. They don't respect us. He is an accountant. So what does he say? He says, Sayyidina, when those people come to me to do their taxes, when they ask me to be dishonest, I tell them, but you will defame Islam. They say, this Muslim is not honest. And what does Imam Sadiq teach me and you? Kunu du'atan lana. Represent us. Be our ambassadors with your fi'l, with your action, not with your words. Not with your dress. Not with your name. Not by your identification, but with your amal and your action. Or people who, for example, are dishonest when it comes to their employers or employees. Islam is a religion based on honesty. And the followers of Ahlul Bayt should be proud to have examples such as Muslim ibn Aqeel. This man gave his life for the principle of honesty, not treachery. Ibn Ziyad was right there. You know the story of Muslim ibn Aqeel. Ibn Ziyad was right there. And Muslim of Al-Aqil was behind the curtain. He could have came out and struck him. And maybe this whole misery wouldn't have happened. Maybe Imam al Hussein would have been saved. He himself, Muslim ibn Aqil, who was a faqih and the representative of Imam al Hussein. But what did he ask himself? He says, I am the representative of Hussein. Can I do treachery? Can I lie? Can I backstab my enemy? He didn't. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, we spoke of the time that they wanted to give him allegiance in the shura. They came and they told him, we give you allegiance ala kitab allahi wa sunnati rasulihi wa sirati shaykhain. Imam Ali could have easily said, they said to him, we give you the allegiance, so you follow kitab Allah, you follow the sunnah of Rasulullah and the method of the shaykhain. He could have said, okay, and the next day he could have said, you know, I won't follow what the shaykhain put. He was honest from day one. He says, وَإِمَّا سِيرَةُ الشَّيْخَيْنِ فَلَا The method of the shaykhain I will not follow. The method of the first khalifa and the second khalifa I will not follow. بَلِ اجْتِحَادُ رَأِي It is my اجْتِحَاد. It is what I feel should be done that I will do as the khalifa. So they didn't give him the khilafah. 
this grand position. Then you find people who lie to nations, not to family, not to friends, not to the government, but to nations. Politicians, this is the job of politicians. Politicians lie to their nations. And back in the day, we used to believe that only corrupt politicians lie to their nations. But today, unfortunately, we have found that politics corrupts even the good people. In Iraq, in the time of elections, you find people abusing and misusing the name of Imam al Hussein and Ahl al Bayt and the Aza of Aba Abdullah and the Marji'iyah and every loophole they can find so that they can get to the seat. So they can, they, they can get to the authority. Are they not the followers of Ahl al Bayt? By name, yes. And this is something that many people have doubts in, you know. How can they be so corrupt? How can somebody who follows Amir al muminin not be righteous and pious? What would we do if we had the same position? What would we do if we were given the same authority? How would we act? You know, sometimes I see people, they are leaders of committees in some jama'ats or Islamic centers, or, and they abuse their power. He is the boss. He's put in place above five people. And he abuses his power. He abuses his authority. A father sometimes in the household, because he has authority, he abuses this power. So we have not been tested with being ministers or prime ministers or generals or the head of brigades or whatever it may be. You know, those exclusive titles. How would we act? They say they had this guy who had this position at work, but he got laid off. He had an important position at work, but he got laid off. So he couldn't find any other job besides managing bathrooms. And I'll tell you, if you, for example, go to the Middle East, many parts of the Middle East, South Asia, you find that up until several years ago, you had no water in the, in the toilet. So you have to carry a bucket. What is it called in Urdu? Huh? Huh? Loti. Loti. So you have, to hold, you have to carry this with you to the bathroom to wash yourself, to cleanse yourself. So this guy, he brought like 10 and he put them in front of the bathroom stalls. And you know, this is custom that when you go into the bathroom, you take one, it's filled with water, then you put some money for this guy who, you know, cleans the bathrooms and he puts, he puts the, uh, the, the water in the buckets and what have you. So they say that whoever would come, he says to him, you take the green one. And the other one comes, he says, you take the yellow one. The other one says, you, no, don't take that one, take that one. So they asked him one day, they said, what's the story behind this? You appointing a water bucket to every person. What does it have to do? He says, what do you think my job is here? My job is I have to manage this. He was given power over buckets of bathroom. He abused it. There is no difference. The reality is there is no difference between the buckets. But this guy, because he's given this little minimum pathetic amount of power over people using the bathroom, he's still abusing the power, telling them, don't take this one, take this one. This is Bani Adam. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَرَّآهُ اسْتَغْنَى As soon as we reach a status, a power, a place in life, that is when we are tested. How will you react? Will you be doing justice to that position that you've been graced with, with Allah, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And some people say, that look, Allah loves this guy, he's given him this position. Allah loves this guy, he's given him this much money. Allah loves this guy, he made him. Who told you? Who told you this is love? 
Who told you that when Allah loves you, He gives you a position of power. Sometimes Allah knows you and He knows if He gives you this position, then you will not be graduating with an A+. You will not be graduating with an honor. So He says, I'm not going to give him this position so I can save his akhirah. Yes, maybe in the dunya he will struggle a little, a little bit, but I will save him. And his happiness and his tranquility and joy for the akhirah. And then you have people who lie to the world, global lies. So small lies and then it grows until it becomes a global lie. So the world globally Something which is right becomes wrong. Something which is wrong becomes right. And today, who controls that? The media. The media, as soon as they wish for a country to be an ally, then overnight they will make them an ally. If overnight they choose that a country is bad, then they make them bad. They make them horrible. Overnight, if they want to make you a terrorist, they'll make you a terrorist. And the next day, if they want to make you, for example, a person who deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, they'll do that as well. And it's the average people who are confused, they're lost by the lies and the fabrications of media. Well... If you want to understand the religion of Islam, back then there was no CNN or BBC or all of that, Fox News. There were people who would stand on the member of Rasulullah and that was the media of the time. They controlled the people. Because they were the ones who were given permission to speak. You think everybody was given permission to speak in the member of Rasulullah? No. You think anybody could just go and lead the Friday sermon? No. If you read history, designated people were given permission to give the khutbah. Designated people were given permission to speak. Designated people were given permission to quote the hadith of Rasulullah. Not everybody can say, Haddathani Rasulullah. Sami'tu Rasulullah. Not anybody can say that. From the Sahaba and the Tabi'i, you come to a personality such as Samar ibn Jundub or Jundab. He was a companion of Rasulullah. And today you find that he has so many hadith in the books of the Muslims. So what, what do I just take his hadith or should I study his personality as a Sahaba? Because you're telling me he's a Sahaba. And I want to study the Sahaba. I want to study this companion. We find that he has a story, a very famous story in the books. He purchased... He sold a home to one of the Ansar in Medina. He sold his home. He sold a yard. There he had a palm tree there. So he said to him, I will sell the house without this palm tree to the Ansari. And the Ansari did this purchase. Then Samara, every day he would go and he would knock the door. He would say, I want to see my palm tree. I want to water my palm tree. I want to sit underneath my palm tree. So this owner told him, look, you're disturbing us. Either choose a day, a time in the day, or a time in the night, or any, just, just give us a specific time. And when you come, look, a palm tree doesn't change overnight. So you saw it yesterday. Hasn't changed since yesterday. So don't disturb us so much. Samara says, no, it's my, my palm tree. I come anytime I want. I stay under it as much as I want. So, he used to knock the door while lunchtime, dinner time, while they were sleeping. They open the door for him. They tell him, please, until he started coming in without permission. And this guy, you know, he's sitting with his family, he's resting, maybe he's not even around. Why are you here? He's, I'm here to make sure your kids are not kicking my palm tree. Make sure you're... So this guy went to Rasulullah, the Ansari. He says, Ya Rasulullah, Samara, he's harassing us. He's harassing us. He comes without permission in the house. 
So Rasulullah says, call him. They brought him. He says to him, sell this palm tree to this Ansari. Sell it to him. So you know that. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I will never sell the palm tree. Rasulullah says, fine, give it to him. He will give you 10 palm trees somewhere else. You give one, take 10. He says, no, I want this palm tree. Rasulullah then gave him an extremely generous offer. He says to him, give him the palm tree wa adminu laka naklatan fil jannah. Give him the palm tree and I will give you a palm tree in paradise. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not interested in palm tree in paradise. I want this paradise, this, this palm tree. So Rasulullah says to the Ansari, Iqla'ha warmiha fi wajhe. Extract the palm tree and throw it in his face. فَلَا ضَرَرَ وَلَا ضِرَارَ Today, the ulama of Islam, they discuss this. Qa'ida. This principle in the, in the religion of Islam that there is no harm done and it should not be received by anyone. So a Muslim cannot harm and should not be harmed. لا ضرر ولا ضرار في الإسلام. This is a principle. This principle came to us from Samar Abdu Jundub or Jundab, this companion. Now, at least, to say the least, when I come to his hadiths, I should be a little hesitant. Because this is how he was with Rasulullah. Rasulullah wants to give him a palm tree in Jannah, he refuses. Samara was appointed by Muawiyah. And since we've discussed history, let's be fair. Which kind of personality was Muawiyah? A personality who came to protect the religion of Islam or to destroy the religion of Islam? A personality who Rasulullah says about him, La Allah, according to all Muslims, La Allah batna. Ida ra'aytum Muawiyah ala minbari, faqtuluh. Muawiyah. As the one who used to, out of obesity, sit and give the khutbah. Sit down, he could not stand. Because he would eat seven meals a day because of the dua of Rasulullah. He was the one that would plug his beard. You know, today the Muslim world, they tell you that the beard should be long. But this Khalifa, he would plug his beards. Wearing long dresses. And he would live like the kings of... The Persian Empire, anyhow, he appointed Samar ibn Jundub to Basra and to Kufa. And he was responsible for the killing of 8,000 people. So when it comes to such individual, to say the least, I have to question him. I have to be able to see whether I take... But some Muslims and some Imams of Islam... They will tell you, we will take the hadith of Samar ibn Jundub above the hadith of Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq. Ja'far al-Sadiq? No. We will not take his hadith. But Samara? This is the dilemma of Islam. So let us come to the hero of this evening. The hero of Islam. This popular transmitter of hadith. Abu Huraira, the companion of Rasulullah, who is honored and respected and glorified by the Muslim world. In every khutbah of Jumu'ah, qal Abu Huraira. If in every sermon, qal Abu Huraira. In every book, teacher of fiqh will tell you from Abu Huraira. Teacher of tafsir will tell you of, of, of Abu Huraira. When did Abu Huraira become a Muslim? He became a Muslim after Amil al-Fatih. Go read his biography. Wallah, this is not from Bihar al-Anwar or... By any Shia scholar, this is the, the biography of those who have written of the life of Abu Huraira. He became a Muslim, Amil Fatih, and he spent three years with Rasulullah, a total of 1095 days. Not even that, because some of the books say that Rasulullah sent him as a Mu'addin to Bahrain to call the Adhan. So if he was gone, even during the lifetime of Rasulullah, less than a thousand days. But let's say he spent a thousand days with Rasulullah. How many hadiths did he transmit? Eight thousand. Eight hadiths a day. 
They tell us that the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they disrespect the Sahaba. Wallah, we don't disrespect the Sahaba. But what was he, a factory of hadith? Eight hadiths a day? Six hadiths a day? Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal narrates 6,000 hadiths from, him, from, from Abu Huraira. That's six hadiths daily. And what kind of personality was Abu Huraira? Was he a genius? Was he a literate man? Did he know how to read and write? The second Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab, called him a su'luk. Meaning he was a, a fool. He was a fool. And another hadith, he calls him a person who is impoverished. He himself, Abu Huraira, he himself in his biography says, I was amongst the people who used to sleep next to the curb of the masjid of Rasulullah. There was a place allocated to those who had no homes, homeless people, no food, no place to stay, no family. They would sleep there. And Abu Huraira was the most popular of them. He was a hungry man, hungry. He says in his biography, some evenings, we would fight over the cover to cover ourselves out of the cold weather. We would fight over it so we can cover some of our bodies. He was a poor man. And he also had a kitten. He used to play with this kitten and Rasulullah used to call him Abu Hurra, not Huraira. Abu Hurra. In fact, his interactions with Rasulullah, Rasulullah would call him Abu Hurra. And he would play with this kitten. And he was a poor man. And there's nothing wrong in being poor. I'm not mocking him because he was poor, but he was illiterate. He was hungry. He says, he says in his own biography, from his own words, narrated by Imam al-Bukhari, Sahibtu Rasulullah, I became a companion of Rasulullah, so that I can fill my stomach. And I used to serve people, he used to serve the family of Uthman. He used to fam serve the family of Ibn Affan ala quti yawmih. This is what they say. On the, so that they pay him some money who can fill his stomach for the day. That's it, no more. Worse than a slave, because you know, slaves then had homes. They had rights. They had food. But those people, they're not slaves. They wish they were slaves. Because they had nowhere to go. Huh? So he narrates many hadiths from Rasulullah that Rasul, he says, I was standing in the masjid of Rasulullah. I was so hungry. I went to, in one hadith he says, I went to the second Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab. I told him, can you hear my Quran? And he was doing tasbih. So he says to him, yes, read some of the Quran. So he said, I read some verses from Surah An-Nisa. And this shows that he was in Medina, because Surah An-Nisa was revealed in Medina. I wanted the second Khalifa to recognize I'm hungry, but he didn't. Another hadith, he says, I stood in front of the door of the Masjid of Rasulullah. Abu Bakr passed. I told him, Ya Abu Bakr, let's read some Quran together. Abu Bakr says to him, I don't have time. Then the second Khalifa came, Umar. He says, let's read some Quran together. He says, my, he says, my intention was I wanted them to see how hungry I was. So they give me some food. Quran was an excuse. So he says to him, I don't have time. Then he says, وَجَاءَ أَبُوا الْقَاسِمِ Meaning who? Rasulullah. فَتَبَسَّمْ He laughed. He smiled. He says, I know why you're here. I know what you're doing. You're hungry. Come with me. So he said, he took me to his home and there was a qadah, a bucket of milk. He told me, he asked a servant in the home, who bought this bucket of milk? They said, she said, Ya Rasulullah, someone bought this bucket of milk as a form of gift to you, Ya Rasulullah. So he says, Rasulullah told me to go and invite Ashab al Safa, the ones that used to sleep on the sidewalk. So he says, he says, Abu Huraira, 
says, I in my heart said, why is Rasulullah telling me to go call them? They're going to finish this milk. I am so hungry for this milk. I need this milk. But he says, I was shy for Rasulullah. So I went and I called them. They all came. And he says the worst part, he says this, he says the worst part Rasulullah told me, tell them to start. And I was so anxious, how much will they drink? Will they finish? And Rasulullah, he says Rasulullah sat there smiling the whole time. Meaning Rasulullah, he knows that it's not going to finish. But he knows this guy is also hungry. So, he says until they all drank, Rasulullah told me, Ya Aba Hurrah, is there some left? He says, yes. So Rasulullah says, Ishrab, drink. He says, I drank a little bit. Rasulullah told me, drink again. He said, I drank again. Rasulullah says, is there more? He says, yes. He says, drink. He says, three times until I was full. Then Rasulullah told me, is there any left? I said, ya, yes, Ya Rasulullah. So he said, I gave it to Rasulullah and Rasulullah finished. Allahu Akbar. This is the biography of Abu Hurairah during the lifetime of Rasulullah. An impoverished, poor, homeless man. And the time of the second Khalifa. First Khalifa, nothing. Second Khalifa, he sent him to Bahrain. He felt sorry for him, he was a companion. And then he says, Abu Hurairah, he says, he says, Umar called me to return from Bahrain. And as soon as I reached, he lashed me, jaladani. Ala asharati alaf dinar. He accused me of stealing 10,000 dinars. The second Khalifa lashed him, he whipped him, and he told him, You have to return 10,000 dinars to Bayt al Mal. You stole from Bayt al Mal. So I told him, and he called me, he says, He called me, the second Khalifa, he called me, Ya Adu Wallah wa Adui. You are my, the enemy of Allah and my enemy, the enemy of the Khalifa. So he says to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Bal ana adu aduwik. I am the enemy of your enemy. I'm not your enemy. So he says, what happened to the 10,000 golden dinars? He says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, ihtasibaha inda Allah. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, just, you know, consider it with Allah. <laughs> so he said, he whipped me, and he made sure that I return the money. And he told him, I, I purchased some horses. Some, you know, this guy now he has horses. And he says, I used to wear silk. Now he wears silk. He wears beautiful clothes, lives in a nice home. He has slaves and servants and nice. So 10,000 golden dinars. The second Khalifa took it from him. He whipped him. And he removed him from his position until, of course, Imam Ali would not appoint such a man. The time of the third Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan, he knew his weakness, Abu Huraira's weakness, money. And he knew that he does not, of course, enjoy, he's not a fond of Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib. So he needed him, he needed him in some support. So Abu Huraira, between us and Allah, we're we not accusing him, but let's look at some of the hadith he mentions in the time of Uthman ibn Affan. Some of the hadith. Rasulullah says, لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ خَلِيلٍ وَخَلِيلٍ مِنْ أُمَّةِ عُثْمَانِ ibn Affan. Every prophet has a khalil, a friend, a close friend. And my khalil in this ummah, is Uthman ibn Affan. And he, for example, praises Uthman and his fada'il saying that the Khalil of Allah, if Allah were to choose a Khalil from the Ummah of Rasulullah, it would be Uthman ibn Affan. And another hadith, he says, Uthman. Malaika are ashamed of Uthman. They don't go near him because they are embarrassed. They are embarrassed of him. In a hadith, Rasulullah, in a long incident, we have no time, we have to move. In an incident, Rasulullah, the angels are not ashamed of him. This is in Bukhari. And then Abu Bakr comes, the angels are not ashamed of him. And then Umar comes, the angels are not ashamed of him. And then Uthman comes, and Rasulullah says, 
The angels are ashamed. They are embarrassed of the position, the grand position of Uthman, who we said who killed him. The Sahaba themselves, they killed him. And they didn't bury his body for three days. And of course, in the time of Uthman, Uthman appointed Muawiyah. And Muawiyah became rich and he became wealthy. Let's talk about some of the hadith of Abu Huraira before we conclude about Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. He says, Rasulullah gave an arrow to Muawiyah and he said, keep this arrow until we meet in paradise. Not that. Forget the arrow. He says, Inna Allah a'tamana ala wahihi thalath. Allah entrusted three people on his revelation. One is me, Rasulullah. Second is Jibra'il. And third is Muawiyah. I don't know if he was laughing when he said this hadith himself. He wants to praise the wife of Rasulullah, Aisha. So just imagine the mentality of this man. What kind of hadith would he use to praise Aisha? In the Arabs, they enjoy this meal. It's meat and the water of the meat, and they put some potatoes next to it, they boil it, so they call it ma laham. And there they put bread, they call it thread. They asked him, can you tell us of the fada'il of the wife of Rasulullah Aisha? He says, yes, Rasulullah has stated that my wife's position Aisha in comparison to the rest of the wives is like the food thread or thread above the rest of the foods. <laughs> and many, many, many hadiths that end up becoming 8,000 hadiths in the legacy of the Muslims today. We asked, are we not allowed to question them? Are we not allowed to say that some of those hadith have been fabricated, placed in the books of the Muslims? Look at the influence, because he was an illiterate man. Look at the influence he's had from the Jewish and Christian scholars. And what did I tell you when I was speaking of the biography of the second Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab? That came Jewish influence into the Muslim community. And that is why you see his ahadith about Musa, and his ahadith about Dawood, and his ahadith about Allah. And is a hadith about the eggs. He says, Allah will sit on a mule every Thursday and come down. Uh, Allah sits on a mule. And he comes down every Thursday to the people, just checking up on them. The hellfire on the day of judgment will not be filled until Allah places his feet in the hellfire. Allah says to Uthman amongst the hadiths, إن الله وجوه يومئذ ناظرة إلى ربها الله everybody إن الله يتجلى لأهل القيامة ويتجلى لك يا عثمان الله will be witnessed in a specific way with specific glory to all the people of the day of judgment and محشر and to you specifically يا عثمان this is your grand position. All the fada'il, all the manaqib of the man who was known to be the brother of Rasulullah, the successor of Rasulullah, the confidant of Rasulullah, the khalil of Rasulullah, were taken from him and given to other people. They took the fada'il copy paste, fada'il of Ali ibn Abi Talib and paste it to other people. And fabrications and lies have spread throughout the Islamic empire to an extent that when the spook, when the truth was being spoken, it was questioned. Today when you look at the books of the Muslims, the position of the Anbiya, they say that he himself, Abu Huraira, says that the angel of death went to Musa. He says to him, Musa, I am here. He says to him, Musa says to him, are you here to just hang out, or are you here to take my life? So he says to him, I'm here to take your life. Musa. Musa punched him. 
Who? Malak al Maut. And gave Malak al Maut a black eye. So Malak al Maut went to Allah. He says, Oh Allah, look what your Prophet did to me. He gave me a black eye. And until today, for your information, Malak al Maut has one eye. He can't see with one of them. This is the legacy of Islam. This is when the member has turned into a form of entertainment, entertainment and lies and fabrications. And that is why Sayyidina wa Mawlana al-Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein Zayn al-Abideen when he was... When he was taken as a captive into the chambers of Yazid, he could not call this a member. He says, Ya Yazid, Yazid, give me permission. So I go on top of those pieces of wood and I speak that which pleases Allah and increases in the knowledge of those sitting here. Meaning prior to that, what was happening to the member? The people are pleased and Allah is displeased. When Allah has pleased and the people gain knowledge, this becomes the member of Rasulullah. And Yazid would say, no. How can I give him permission? They came to him, they said, Ya Amir, he is sick, he is ill, he is young. He has just seen all those calamities, he can't even stand. What can he possibly do? What's his threat? He says, إِنَّهُ مِنْ أَهْلُ بَيْتٍ زُقُّ الْعِلْمَ زَقَّ كَبِيرُهُمْ لَا يُقَاسْ وَصَغِيرُهُمْ he says he, they are from a progeny, from an Ahlul Bayt, that their elders cannot be compared to the rest of the humanity. And their young ones are like pieces of charcoal, you cannot hold on to them. He will not disembark from the member unless he exposes me and exposes my fathers and Ala Abi Sufyan. But Allah now has a plan. The plan after the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein for the protection of the blood of Hussein. Assalamu alayka ya Thar Allah wa ibn Thar'ih wal Witra al Mawtur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then enables Imam Zain al Abideen to stand on the minbar. And what does he say? He says, أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ أُوتِينَا سِتًّا وَفُضِّلْنَا بِسَابْعٍ أُوتِينَا الْعِلْمَ وَالْحِلْمَ وَالسَّمَاحَةَ وَالْفَصَاحَةَ وَالْمَحَبَّةَ وَالشَّجَاعَةَ وَالْمَحَبَّةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَفُضِّلْنَا بِأَنَّ مِنَّا النَّبِيَّ الْمُخْتَارِ وَمِنَّا الطَّيَّارِ وَمِنَّا أَسَدُ اللَّهِ وَأَسَدُ رَسُولِهِ ومنا سبطا هذه الأمة ومنا سيدة نسائها ومنا مهدي هذه الأمة O oh people, we have been given six and superiorized above the rest of humanity by seven virtues for amongst us is the last and the divine messenger and from us is Ja'far al-Tayyar and from us is the Lion of Allah and from us is the mistress of all women. And from us are the masters of the youth of a paradise. And from us is the Mahdi of this Ummah. And we have been superiorized above the rest of humanity. For we have been given virtue. We have been given wisdom, knowledge, forbearance, eloquence, bravery, and love in the hearts of the believers. أيها الناس من عرفني فقد عرفني ومن لم يعرفني أعرفه بحسبي ونسبي أنا ابن مكة ومنا أنا ابن الزمزم والصفا أنا ابن من دنا فتدلى فكان قاب قوسين أو أدنى أنا ابن من أوحى إليه الجليل ما أوحى أنا ابن من صلى بملائكة السماء مثنا مثنا أنا ابن محمد المصطفى O oh people, I am the son of the man who sat on the bank of the Burak and elevated to the seventh heaven 
I am the man, I am the son of the man who reached the closest proximity to Allah. I am the, man, the son of the man who received the final revelation. I am the son of the man who elevated to the throne and the seventh heaven. I am the, man, the son of the man who led the prayers with the prophets and the angels and the residents of the heavens. I am the son of Muhammad al-Mustafa. Then he continued on to inform them of who he was. Ayyuhannas, an abnu man daraba bayna yaday rasulillahi bisayfayn. Wa baya al bayatayn. Wa hajar al hijratayn. Wa lam yushrik billahi tarfata ayn. An abnu yaqsub al mu'mineen. وتاج البكائين أنا ابن وارث المشعرين وأبو السبطين ذاك جدي علي بن أبي طالب I am the son of the man who fought with two swords and two spears I am the son of the man who went on both migrations I am the son of the man who never did shirk in Allah, even for a blink of an eye. I am the son of the man who protected Rasulullah, and his right would be Jibra'il, Al-Mu'ayyad bi Jibra'il wa Mika'il, and on his left would be Mika'il. I am the son of the man who slept in the bed of Rasulullah, the inheritor of his knowledge, the bravest of his companions, the killers of the enemies of Islam, the father of the Sibtain, وَوَارِثُ الْمَشْعَرَيْنِ The inheritor of the sacred places. That is my grandfather, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Then he says, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ أَنَبْنُ نَقِيَّاتِ الْجُيُوبِ أَنَ ابْنُ عَدِيمَاتِ الْعُيُوبِ أَنَ ابْنُ خَيْرِ النِّسَاءِ أَنَ ابْنُ خَدِيجَةَ الْكُبْرَى أَنَ ابْنُ فَاطِمَةَ الزَّحْرَى O people, I am the son of the immaculate woman, the purified woman. I am the son of Khadija al-Kubra. I am the son of Fatima al-Zahra. At this time, they could guess who he is, but he continues and he says, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ أَنَا ابْنُ مَنْ حَرَمُهُ مِنَ الشَّامِ إِلَى الْعِرَاقِ تُسْبَى أنا ابن من قضى ضمآنا أنا ابن من قتل عطشانا أنا ابن من بكت عليه ملائكة السماء والطير في الهواء أنا ابن من قتل من القفاء I am the son of the man who has Haram, who his family, who his wife and children are taken as captives from Iraq to Sham. I am the son of the man who died thirsty next to the Euphrates. I am the son of the man who cried for him the heavenly angels and the birds in the heavens. I am the son of the man who broke the hearts of the Mu'mineen. I am the son of the man who his head was severed. Allahu Akbar. Then the crowd had burst into cries, into tears. They could not handle this moving statement by Imam Zainul Abideen. So Yazid says, Ya Mu'adhin, go and do the Adhan. And it was not time for Adhan. He went on top of the Mu'adhan he, and he called out the Adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Imam Zainul Abideen says, La Akbar min Allah shay. The Mu'addin says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Imam Zayn al-Abideen says, Shahida bithalika azmi wa lahmi wa dami wa aqli wa mukhi wa jami'i jawarihi. I am a witness that there is no God besides Allah and all my limbs are a witness to his oneness and his existence. Then the Mu'addin says, Ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Imam Zayn al-Abideen takes off his amama. He sheds his tears. He says, Ya Yazid, 
أهذا محمد جدك أم جدي يا يزيد is this محمد in the adhan your grandfather or mine أن زعمت أنه جدك فكذبت وافتريت وإن قلت بأنه جدي فلم قتلت أبي عطشانا بكربلاء And if you know that he is my grandfather, if you say he is your grandfather, then you have lied. And if you know he is my grandfather, why did you kill my father, thirsty next to the Euphrates? سيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم Ten times, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم اللهم إنا نسألك ونقسم عليك بمحمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والتسعة المعصومين من درية الحسين اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا اللهم استر عيوبنا اللهم شافي وعافي كل مريض لا سيما المرضى المنظورين والله every man and woman present in this majlis with a sin forgive our sins with a haja give us our hajat honor us with the ziyar of Hussein honor us with the shafa'ah of Hussein keep us amongst the sincere khuddam and servants of Hussein اللهم ادخل على أهل القبور السرور اللهم شافي وعافي كل مريض سد فقرنا بغناك غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اقض عنا الدين واجرنا من الفقر إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات عفوا وغفرانا Now let us all do this dua sincerely for صاحب العصر والزمان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وإلى أرواح العلماء والشهداء وخدمة الحسين نهدي جميعا ثواب سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات